Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar on Framing Controversial Issues. I'd just like to begin uh, by introducing Equi8 to you briefly. Um, if this is your first webinar with us, Equi8, we're a, a small consulting firm located in Alberta, Canada, and our, our focus is on uh, health inequity and its root causes, especially the health gradient. We work with community groups, health regions, Aboriginal organizations, you know, government and others to help address these issues. We welcome you today. We're glad you joined us. And we're looking forward to an exciting conversation together about framing and how it can be applied to help us in our efforts to work on health and social issues. Uh, just a quick orientation to your webinar interface. Uh, if you look at the top of your webinar screen, uh, you'll see a few icons. Um, one will be phone. You can participate uh, either through your computer, listening and speaking, or um, through your telephone. And the telephone, it is a long distance number, uh, so please keep that in mind if you choose to participate by telephone instead of through your computer. Uh, there's also a, a My Mood icon, and if you hover your mouse over that icon, you'll see some options appear, a thumbs up, a thumbs down, raising your hand, uh, I'm fine. And um, for those of you that, that aren't uh, on the phone or, or using a computer microphone where, where you'll be able to talk, uh, this is how you'll be able to interact throughout the webinar today. So when it comes time for questions and answers towards the end, uh, you, know, you can raise your hand or type in your question in your chat window there on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, as you go through the webinar, there'll be a few places where you know, we have questions or things we can discuss. You know, again, you can raise your hand or, or type in your chat window to uh, participate that way. So just to make sure this is working, if, uh, if you all don't mind going there and uh, giving a thumbs up, what will happen is you see it appear beside your name. Yeah, perfect. You can see all the names of the participants on the top. You click thumbs up, it appears beside your name, and it helps us just to see who has a question or comment and, and how we can include you in today's conversation. I'd also like to say that uh, we are recording today's webinar, so a recording will be up on our website um, as soon as it's processed. Usually this happens fairly quickly, uh, probably by tomorrow the, the recording will be up again. So. Um, don't feel like you need to take scrupulous notes if you don't want to. The recording will be available and you'll be able to access it uh, anytime you wish to go over anything that, that we discussed today. So today's webinar, as I said, it focuses on framing controversial issues. We'll introduce the topic of issue framing and reframing. We'll also offer some ways this can be applied uh, to the benefit of, of you and your work. But before we get into framing, uh, let's talk about controversial issues for a second. I want this webinar to be as applied and useful as possible, so I'd like you to think of one or two controversial issues that are part of your work, whatever they may be. And the nice thing about controversial issues is um, you know, it's controversial to one person or organization might not be to another, so it's a matter of perspective. There's no right or wrong answer, it's just whatever in your experience is a controversial issue. Uh, I've got a few in my head, but I'd like to hear some of yours. Um, a few examples from the people on the webinar today about controversial issues that, that you work with. So if somebody would like to, let's, let's go back to the my mood, if you'd like to raise your hand uh, to indicate that you're willing to share a controversial issue that's part of your work, and then type it in the chat window, Let's get a few examples that we can use um, as we go through the webinar today. That's what I'm looking for. Angela Wheeler from here on County Healthy. Hello, Angela. She said, smoke-free outdoor space policies and bylaws as a controversial issue. That's a great example. Uh, can you can you chat a bit more about what makes it controversial for you there, Angela? And Mara from Mississauga, breastfeeding in public, definitely controversial. Same thing, man. If you could just add another sentence or two about, just to give us a bit more context, what is it that makes this issue uh, controversial 
your experience. And if someone has a third issue you can think about, uh, feel free to add it. Lori Kleinsman, advocating for increase in social assistance rates. Thank you, Lori. That's a beautiful issue. Definitely controversial. There's a nice range of issues in these three. So Angela adds some context. People may feel that these policies and bylaws invade personal choice or rights. Definitely. That's in relation to the smoke-free outdoor policies and upper space policies and bylaws. That's definitely a, a part of culture and, and how it's expressed, especially here in Alberta. I'm not from Alberta. I'm originally, I'm originally from BC, uh, but living here in the past you know, six or seven years, um, personal choice and rights is definitely part of the conversation here. Mayra had some context to her uh, issue about breastfeeding in public. Is it sexual or is it a method to feed a baby? Great. And Lisa, got a few more here. Uh, nutrition policy and recreational facilities. Water fluoridation. I mean, a casino may create jobs, but it has a negative impact on health. Needles exchange and harm reduction programs. Cosmetic pesticide use. Okay, these are beautiful examples. Thank you for sharing them. So we'll, we'll pick a few and uh, go through them uh, to highlight some of the things that we'll talk about today. But keep your own issues in mind. And if, if we haven't, if the connections still aren't clear, perhaps, um, when we get to the question and answer, se answer session, uh, feel free to ask your questions about your issue specifically. I'm also happy to have conversations after today's webinar about any of these types of things as well. So thank you for sharing those issues, and we'll get to move on with uh, today's webinar. Okay. So I'd like to start by telling you how we came into contact with the idea of issue framing um, many, many, many years ago. Uh, we were doing some work on affordable housing, and it's a great example of a polarizing issue, and it often creates the phenomenon we affectionately know as nimbyism, or not in my backyard. And it, you know, this is the general idea that, you know, your idea is a great idea, and we need it somewhere, but anywhere but my backyard. You know, that's a common reaction to a variety of issues that uh, are discussed or worked on in the community. So for people who support affordable housing, um, they talk about the need for affordable rentals for seniors or low-income populations or other populations, and there's a way of keeping them involved in the community. People who might be against affordable housing, they, they cite anecdotes or statistics about neighborhood blight, uh, decreasing property values, uh, higher crime rates or other issues they can connect to the development of uh, affordable housing. And what often results is an impasse. Neither side is willing to budge, and it just creates difficulty for anybody w wanting to work on the issue. So I was trying to figure out what could be done about this NIMBY phenomenon. And in doing some searching, I came across an organization called the Berkeley Media Studies Group based out of Berkeley, California. And an issue brief, issue brief uh, they had created that applied issue framing to the work of some housing advocates from the state of Oregon. Now, these housing advocates it was a community coalition of dedicated people who were lobbying the city of Portland and the state legislature in Oregon for uh, some policy decisions and other things that would provide a funding for affordable housing developments. And they weren't having much success, hardly any at all, in fact. Um, not even, not just in terms of outcome, but also in terms of process. They just weren't getting the engagement um, that they hoped for in order to make progress on their issue. So they went through a process uh, over a period of a few years, three to four years, that took them from having no impact and very little engagement to getting onto the city and state legislative agendas and having funding allotments for affordable housing um, legislated. It was quite a phenomenal turnaround. 
Now, picture, let's pause here for a minute, picture the controversial issue you identified at the start of today's web webinar. And many times the issues that we work with, we describe them to others in the work we do um, in ways that mirror the key messages we found in the research evidence. It might be a particular article or study or a case study that we found impactful and we use some of those key messages to help describe our issue, why it's important, and why people should support it. Now, the affordable housing advocates in the state of Oregon, uh, they did the same thing. That was their approach. And they identified affordable housing. This is their definition. When they would go and talk to people about affordable housing, and someone would say, well, what is it? Why is this an issue? And they'd say, well, affordable housing is affordable to people earning less than 80% of the median family income so they are not spending more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. Now, technically, this definition is perfect. You know, it describes exactly what the evidence would say about what affordable housing is and how it you know, balances uh, people's income on with other needs that, that they have. But they weren't getting anywhere with this uh, definition and their efforts around it. So they went through a process of understanding how their audience perceived their issue understanding the ideas this definition of the issue suggested to their audience or didn't suggest, and finding some ways of communicating their issue more effectively. And what they came up with after a lot of discussion and effort was this definition. Housing should be affordable enough to be able to pay rent and still put food on the table. If you compare the two definitions, this one might be less reflective the new definition might be less reflective of key messages found in the research evidence, but it's an easier definition to digest. It's easier for people to connect with and understand. So this was the first part of the work. They continued their work on framing their key messages, you know, how to describe what it was they were about. And one change they made was to, re to change their focus that had been on low-income people. Now, in describing this, one of their group described this change. They said, and I quote, if you focus only on poor people, you help perpetuate the myth that poor people don't work. The research also revealed that the public believes that seniors, people with disabilities, and single parents ought to have housing they can afford. So as a result of this analysis and their discussion, this group deleted low income from their core statements. Now, in hindsight, this may seem a minor change, but it was a profound one. So low, low income, in many ways, it represented their target population. You know, if we're talking about affordable housing, this is who it's for and what the evidence speaks about. But the frame it suggested was harmful to progressing their efforts. So they made the decision to focus more on the impact of their message, which would definitely include low income people and those that impacted, than on whether or not low income people needed to be the focus of their message. So continuing their process, they ended up with four core statements for their affordable housing advocacy. And these are their four core statements. First, hardworking people should be able to afford housing and still have enough money for food and basic necessities. Second, children deserve an opportunity to succeed in school and life, which is tied to having a stable home. Third, housing gives people an opportunity to build better lives, to succeed you need a place called home. Fourth, it's only fair that everyone has a safe, decent place to live. You can see these messages, again, if we back up a few slides, they're quite different than the message they started with. Where they were defining affordable housing you know, according to the technical definitions that they found uh, to help them understand it in their initial stages of their work. So one of their people described the impact of working with these new messages. This was their experience. They were invited uh, by a coalition of churches and faith-based communities to give a 25-minute presentation on affordable housing. They spent no more than three minutes talking about the need and dedicated the rest of the time to the solution and the message, everyone needs a place to call home. Now, recalling that people learn best from stories, they linked their message to scriptures, t tales from his own childhood, and even the Declaration of Independence. They tailored the message to their audience. He didn't mention the word affordable housing anywhere in his speech, even though he was asked to give a presentation on affordable housing. Now, as the talk concluded, people were on their feet with applause. 
if you've ever given a speech, that's an uncommon experience, as much as we'd like to experience it, perhaps. This is the first time this person had received a standing ovation for any speech. Their new messaging worked. You know, it got them results as they talked about their work. It also got them results you know, in, the, in the policy world that they were trying to influence. What happened to them um, after a few years, the, um, the state, House, and Senate, they held a joint hearing and introduced a proposal for the legislative session that the housing advocates had been advocating for, for $100 million to be allocated for affordable housing. The Senate chair uh, of the committee that was responsible for this opened the hearing saying, today's hearing is about housing and it's about opportunity. So they could hear some of their messaging and in the words of the senator uh, presenting their case. Uh, Portland, the city, not just at the state do they have success, but the city also passed a resolution to create what they call an urban renewal set-aside. And the set-aside guarantees a percentage of funds of any urban renewal project would be allocated uh, to affordable housing, which had been one of their uh, central policy targets for a number of years. But they're finally able to make progress on both of these. You know, if they adopt the new ways of talking about their messages, that worked. So framing worked for them. This was my introduction to framing, how to get past the whole NIMBY phenomenon that can polarize people and really stall progress, um, looking at what had happened in the state of Oregon and then how they were able to go from not making any progress and being stuck on an issue to having huge progress and huge um, policy decisions that really made affordable housing impactful in their communities. So what is framing? Let's go back to some definitions. How is it defined? What is this thing that, that we're talking about? Now, the Berkeley Media Studies Group, who wrote the case study on affordable housing, uh, they describe frames this way, quote, all people come to new information they see or hear with ideas already in their heads about the way the world works. Those existing notions form the mental structures or conceptual frames that allow us to integrate new information into our brains into a coherent way. Without even knowing it, we use frames to categorize information, identify patterns, and derive meaning from them." End of quote. Another description of framing, there's an excellent article in the Harvard Business Review. They describe frames this way, quote, what exactly does it mean to frame or reframe an issue? Think about the metaphor behind the concept. A frame focuses attention on the painting it surrounds. Different frames draw out different aspects of the work. If we put a painting in a red frame, it brings out the red in the work. Putting the same painting in a blue frame brings out the blue. How someone frames an issue influences how others see it and focuses their attention on particular aspects of the issue. Framing is the essence of targeting a communication to a specific audience. Although conceptually, framing seems pretty straightforward, the reality is that most people don't do it well." End of quote. A third description comes from an organization, the Frameworks Institute. And they describe framing this way. Frames are organizing principles that are socially shared and persistent over time, that work symbolically to meaningfully structure in the world. Now, as we can see from these three descriptions, Frames influence how we understand the world and are therefore very important to any and all of our work as a way of increasing support and minimizing opposition to the issues that we work on. In fact, frames are so important that when new facts are submitted that do not resonate with the frames we hold in our head, it is the facts that are rejected, not the frames. This is a quote from the Frameworks Institute. I'll repeat it. When new facts are submitted that do not resonate with the frames we hold in our heads, it is the facts that are rejected, not the frames. The frames are so powerful in helping us understand the world, you know, filtering what we hear and what we see, that will reject facts or not pay attention to them, rather than reframe our frames that we use to understand the world. Now this is because when we're presented with new information, we tend to understand it by filing it into the framework of something we already stand, understand. 
So if someone's telling you a story or sharing an experience, often what happens is part of our mind listens but also tries to connect their story or, or their experience with something that we know and are familiar with. And once that connection is made, you know, it helps us to understand, to comprehend. That's one way that framing helps us interpret things. We file things into the framework of something we already understand. This point's very important. Frames trump facts. Now this is why you probably have this experience. I know I have many times. You might be having a great conversation with somebody about a juicy topic such as politics or religion or something else and you feel from your point of view it's a great conversation and you've made some great points. In fact, you might feel like you won the conversation if, if that's possible to, to win conversations. But you find fairly quickly that nothing's changed. The person you spoke with about politics or whatever else, they still believe the same way. Despite all your persuasive facts and arguments and the things that you presented to them, and not only do they believe the same way, they may even be firmer in their opinion or understanding of the situation because their perception of the issue is created by their frame of how the world and particular issues work. Now, there's a few frames that you'll often see in the media. You know, many issues, you know, we learn about them uh, through how they're described in the media, for better or for worse. That's how most people learn about issues today. Now, three frames that are commonly used in the media are conflict, consensus, and reaction. The choice of which frame is used to describe a story is important. For example, if, we, if the politicians, and I will leave the U.S. as an example, so if the politicians in Washington, D.C. support going to war, which has happened, but a significant percentage of the population are ambivalent or opposed to that action, a news reporter could frame the article with a consensus frame, focusing on how Republicans and Democrats are agreed in this decision. Alternatively, they could give the story a conflict frame, focusing on the difference of opinion between the politicians and the populace, who are opposed or ambivalent to their decision. And you can see, if you picture this in your head, the picture that emerges is quite different, depending on which frame the reporter chooses to apply to the story. The choice of frame really communicates the message that people are left with. Quite important. Now, an example uh, of framing specific to public health comes from the field of tobacco. And we're probably familiar with the Marlboro Man. Uh, the Frameworks Institute looked at smoking uh, as an example, and here's how they described it. The tobacco industry has, for many years, framed cigarette smoking as something that real men do. These companies were successful by representing strong, rugged men and smokers. The advocacy groups who protested the use of tobacco had to change that image by reframing the issue as one of a health concern. Such groups began the battle by representing cigarette smokers as having black lungs, yellow fingernails, and bad breath. This reframing has been successful at changing the focus of the issue. Now, here are some examples of reframing involving the tobacco industry. So I'm going to read statements to you. The tobacco industry framing is first, with the health-oriented reframing that follows. You can see the different things that they're emphasizing in this communication. So the tobacco industry framing. Smoking is a matter of personal choice. The example of the bylaws in public places, the exact same thing. Smoking is a matter of personal choice. The, the health-oriented reframe, people smoke because they are addicted. The tobacco industry message, smoking bans discriminate against smokers. The health reframe, non-smokers have the right to breathe clean air. The tobacco industry message, the tobacco companies do good through sponsorship of cultural, athletic, and community events. The reframe, the tobacco companies attempt to gain innocence by association. The tobacco company message, tobacco is just one of many presumed health hazards. Why aren't we regulating fat? The health reframe, tobacco is the only legal product that when used as intended, kills. 
if you compare those examples, you can see the ideas that they were suggesting. There were some key words, discriminate, innocence, addiction, personal choice. When these key words each suggest to the audience something about the issue and something about the appropriate response to the issue. Now, the power in frames lies not only in how they influence our perception of issues, but in the fact that they're malleable. We can change them. We can reframe them. Now, there are a few keys to reframing frames. Now, the first key is that ideas and issues come in hierarchies. There are some ideas and issues that are more important than others. Higher level frames act as primes for lower level frames, and the higher level frames in this hierarchy, map their values and reasoning onto the lower level frames. We'll get into some specific examples of what these are. But what happens is that disagreements often happen at the level of lower level frames, when in fact there is agreement at a higher level frame if we can get there. So the higher level frames, the level one frames, act as a sort of bridge that can create common ground on an issue from which specific actions can be explored from a position of common interest rather than a position of opposition. But the, if a hierarchy exists, what does it look like? The Framework Institute identifies it this way. They describe level one, level two, and level three ideas. Level three are the specific issues. These are the things we often focus on in our work. This is rainforest or earned income tax credits or increases in social assistance rates, or breastfeeding in public, or smoke-free outdoor spaces, policies, and bylaws, or cosmetic pesticide use. You know, these are the very specific issues that we're trying to have an impact on uh, to change or to improve in the work we're trying to do. These are at the bottom of the hierarchy. The level two, these are the issue types. So what is it we're talking about? Are we talking about the environment? Are we talking about child care? Are we talking about um, employment, you know, these kind of things. Level one in the hierarchy, these are big ideas. There's a list here, freedom, justice, community, success, prevention, responsibility. These are the big, ide the big ideas. We can see in these, this description of the three levels, the difference is in their specificity. When things get stuck in a contest between specific issues, to level three, Again, which is often where the difficulties come, common ground can sometimes be found by moving up to level two or level one in the conversation. So I'll, let me see let's see if we can figure out some examples together. Um, Angela, let's go with your example of smoke free outdoor space policies and bylaws. So what could be a level one idea connected to that specific issue? I'll ask the question of Angela, but anyone else who has an idea as well, feel free to, to type in your response in the chat window. If the specific issue is smoke-free outdoor space policies and bylaws, what's a level one idea that connects with that specific issue? Choose one from this list if it fits, or come up with your own. Angela types prevention of youth starting to smoke, the responsibility to be positive role models. It's a good example. You know, prevention is one of these level one big ideas. And so if there's so if we if we think this through, if we have a, kind of a mini thought experiment, you know, if, if there's a discussion of smoke-free public spaces and there's controversy around um, whether or not to support this. Some people see it as an infringement on their rights. Um, others see it as good health uh, policy. You know, if, if we step back to, well, it's really about preventing youth from starting to smoke. That's a more difficult issue to disagree with than smoke-free bylaws in public places 
or preventing exposure secondhand smoke. Thank you, Fernando. That's a great example, too. That's been used quite effectively uh, in the anti-smoking efforts that have been out there. It's not about personal choice. It's about the consequences. You know, people who get lung cancer who have never smoked before, you know, these types of things. It's a great example. So the point here in this hierarchy of issues and ideas is you know, we get specific in the issues we work on. We focus on level three. But when we find that we're getting stuck, look to level two or level one as ways to get unstuck. And by appealing to the higher level values to reframe our issue, we signal to people how to think about our social issues. That's the first key in reframing, is this hierarchy of ideas and issues. The second key is that frames can be thought of as episodic or thematic. Now, the episodic frame represents a portrait, and the thematic frame pulls back and presents a landscape view. Now, this is important. The Framework Institute, they describe it this way. The importance of this distinction is that the two types of frames have very different effects on how people view a given problem. The more episodically social issues are framed, the less likely it is that citizens will hold government accountable for solving the problem. The more thematic and contextual the coverage, the more likely it is that citizens will see the issue as one appropriate to government resolution. So what do these look like? Let's consider two versions of the same story. And it's a story written by the Community Foundation about an infant who was bitten by rats. Version one of the story goes like this. An infant left sleeping in his crib was bitten repeatedly by rats while his 16-year-old mother went to cash her welfare check. A neighbor responded to the cries of the infant and brought the child to the hospital where he was treated and released in his mother's custody. The mother, Angie Burns of the South End, explained softly, I was only gone five minutes. I left the door open so my neighbor would hear him if he woke up. I never thought this would happen in the daylight. That's the version one story. Now pay attention to who the story focused on and what it suggests as causes and solutions to you. Now here's version two of the story. Same story, different description. Rats bit eight-month-old Michael Burns five times yesterday as he napped in his crib. Burns is the latest victim of a rat epidemic plaguing an inner-city neighborhood labeled the zone of death. Health officials say infant mortality rates in these neighborhoods approach those in many third-world countries. A public health department spokesperson explained that federal and state cutbacks forced short staffing at rat control and housing inspection programs. The result, noted Joaquin Nunes, MD, a pediatrician at Central Hospital, is a five-fold increase in rat bites. He added, the irony is that Michael lives within walking distance of some of the world's best medical centers. In the story. We can see that each version of the story represents a different frame. One was a portrait focusing on a person and their experience with a zoom-in lens. I want to carry that analogy a bit further. One was very much a landscape portrait. It added context to our understanding. And did you notice how the two stories changed your perception of where the problem was and where the solution was? The first story just focused on the young mother and her situation. The second story described a much greater context of cutbacks and other things that contributed to the situation happening. The second story suggests solutions much different from those of the first story. That's a great example of portrait versus landscape. Now, unfortunately, the media often uses portrait as their way of describing issues. So if you're working on a social or a health issue and you're, you're having some difficulties or challenges or wish to increase the support or reduce the opposition to your issue, one way to do that is to describe it from a landscape perspective, to add some context to your issue. Not to get bogged down in numbers or statistics, but to add some context that removed the focus away from individuals back to the greater 
wider perspective. That's the second key to reframing. The first is the hierarchy of ideas. The second is this idea of portraits and landscapes. Now, framing and reframing can be applied in multiple settings on multiple issues. If you're working on policy, the question you might be considering is, why do some issues become public problems reaching agenda status and others do not? The answer to this question lies in framing. An issue must be constructed in such a way that it's perceived as a social and public problem. That's the first step in any policy work. If, if an issue is not a public problem, there won't be a report for public policy. Sorry, technical glitch there. If an issue is not perceived as a public problem, there won't be support for public policy to address it. Now, whether or not an issue is viewed as a social or public problem, it's not based on the severity of the issue, how bad it is, how many people are affected, but on how society perceives the issue. It doesn't matter how severe it is, really. It only matters if people talk about it in a way that frames the issue as a public problem worthy of attention. So the way to do that, again, think back to landscape perspective and the hierarchy of ideas. So the essence of framing, we're going to sum this all up, is being mindful of how we communicate about the issues we work on. So in a nutshell, when we work on framing, we should be considering what frames already exist or have been defined for your issue. Sometimes we think an issue hasn't been framed. It has. Remember, people fit issues or new information into their existing frames. So even for a new issue that we don't think has been framed, they'll be received in a default frame that conditions the response to the issue, whether or not people will support it or even understand it the way that you do. The second point would be, what frame do we want? This is part of a larger strategy. What frame do we want for our message that will help people understand the issue in a way that we understand it and agree with our proposed solution or intervention for this issue. The third level, third, third point would be, what are the level one, level two, and level three frames that could apply to our issue? So instead of just focusing on the specific issue, the level three frame, if you can map all three together, level one, level two, level three, remember that the hierarchy trickles down. So your level one frame, freedom for example, trickles down to level two and level three, and how people understand the issue and the specific issues. And then fourth, you know, applying a thematic or episodic perspective. There are times when it helps to have that episodic perspective, to cast a portrait, to make what can be a big or overwhelming issue specific. You know, often in doing policy advocacy or talking to a politician, you know, having that anecdote can be powerful. So here's a person's experience but it needs to be used with caution in the context of framing because it puts the focus on the individual instead of government or other um, areas where the solution could come from. So more often than not, it's the thematic or landscape perspective that we want to use, but the episodic or portrait perspective can be helpful in the right place and at the right time. So these are just a few of the basics we've reviewed today. If you're interested in framing and you've had some ideas about how this can be applied in your work, I'd highly recommend uh, two of the resources I've referenced today, the Frameworks Institute and Berkeley Media Studies Group. They have some great information and resources, lots of case studies, examples, and that you can see where the before and after of framing and reframing and um, case studies of how people have applied this, and you can learn from their experiences of how they've done it. As I said before, we're also happy to have conversations with any of you about your issues and how framing can be applied and suggested to them. So I'd like to open some time up uh, for questions. Again, if you go up to the My Mood and do the raise your hand uh, icon there, it'll show a raised hand beside your name. and. 
that that'll help us just keep some order uh, within some questions and answers discussion. So let's open it up for questions. Um, does anyone have any questions about issue framing or about how it can be applied uh, to their specific issue? Angela, I see you've got your hand raised. Is that a new hand raised or is that from before? The hand got unraised. If that was from before. Thank you, Angela. I'm scrolling through, I don't see any hands being raised. I'll give you another minute or two. You know, think about the controversial issues that you began today's webinar with. And hopefully what we've walked through and discussed can be helpful to you in working on these issues. And really the whole point of framing, the essence of framing is avoiding those impasses. Uh, somebody had the example of community water fluoridation as their issue. That's a great example. You know, if you've been involved in those discussions at a municipal level, often what happens is on the one side you'll have public health evidence why community water fluoridation is good. It's good public health practice. It's good for our health. On the other side, of the conversation, you have people talking about uh, this goes against our freedom, we're being medicated against our consent, uh, that kind of a conversation. And it creates an impasse. But you can see there are different levels too. The one conversation is about community water fluoridation, it's about a specific issue. Right? We know if we fluoridate the community water supply, we'll see this much reduction in dental caries, particularly among low income or other uh, marginalized populations who don't have the same access to dental care that others do. Right? That's a specific issue, level three conversation. The other side of the issue is level one, big idea. This is about freedom. It's about being medicated against our consent. You know, this isn't right. Now, at least in Alberta, where, where we are, the side that usually wins that argument is the level one side. So it's the side arguing against community water fluoridation. Now the response is usually from the public health people, we need better evidence, we need more data. We need to be, you know, more data and better evidence to be more persuasive in swaying people's opinion that community water fluoridation is effective and desirable. And usually that doesn't work either. The opportunity for them is to reframe their argument. With level one frame, could they meet the argument of being medicated against your consent with that could help to establish some common ground or a minimum a competition between level one frames at the same level where people could see clearly, more clearly, what the choice is. That's one example of how reframing that particular discussion could help create a much more favorable outcome. Susan Roberts, hi Susan, um, just typed in her chat window. Universal school food strategies in Alberta, growing, cooking, eating together in school and outside school. Okay, sorry, I, I missed the first one. So um, you're thinking about this in relation to a universal school food strategy in Alberta, growing, cooking, eating together in school and outside school. It's a great example. Now, if we think of that, and I know you're thinking about this, I'll just add a few thoughts of my, of my own, uh, just about that particular example. You know, again, that's a very specific issue. Some people will agree with that immediately. This is a great idea. Uh, let's do it yesterday, that kind of reaction. Others will resist it um, for any number of reasons. You know, it's, it's extra work. We are already worked way too hard in this setting. Um, you know, this is way outside the mandate of education. We're about reading, writing, and arithmetic. What are, what are we talking about growing food and, and doing these kind of things? Uh, they won't see the connections that, that you see in the issue. So this is a specific issue. Remember, this is a level three issue. So if we apply the hierarchy of ideas to this issue, how can we frame it in a level two or a level one issue? 
create some common ground and reduce opposition to it. If we go back to the affordable housing example at the very beginning of today's webinar uh, from Oregon, even how they had changed their message. They went from defining affordable housing, you know, 80%, 30%, to a very basic statement of how affordable housing was connected to almost a basic right and a, and a necessity. And I'm sure you've done some messaging in that strategy, but what framing would suggest is your, your odds of having impact will be greater by focusing on level one frames, responsibility and prevention, great ideas, level two, children and health, focusing on there and letting them frame your whole conversation and then introducing your level two and level three frames. A great example. Thank you for sharing. I'm not seeing any other hands being raised. That's that's fine. I hope what we've shared today. Again, this is this has been a issue framing 101. You know, in the time we have, we're not able to to dive do too deeply into these issues. But it's an introduction to the topic, and hopefully, it's uh, given you some ideas about how issue framing can help you be more successful with the health and social issues that you may be focused on and working on. So. As I mentioned at the beginning, we did record today's webinar, and this will be up on our website uh, shortly. We'd also appreciate your, your feedback on today's webinar. We have a brief online evaluation that we'll be sending out to you. Um, if you don't mind completing it, that gives us some feedback really as to how useful today's webinar has been. And if you have any questions that either you have now or come up later that, that weren't answered or discussed, you know, we're happy to uh, follow up on them that way. We also have, with Equiate, you know, if this is your first webinar with us, we have what we call our, our four-hour rule, and I'd like to, to mention this. Um, we built, we modeled this after Google. It's always a good idea to follow Google's footsteps. Google has what they call a 20% rule, and they, um, what they do is they give their software engineers the freedom to focus 20% of their work time on whatever they want to, that's consistent with Google's overall mission and purpose. So rather than being told by your manager or your boss's boss's boss, you know, what to work on, whatever ideas you come up with in your work, Google's engineers are able to focus on. Now this freedom they've given, this is where Gmail came from. Gmail wasn't a great idea that a manager had. It was a great idea that a software engineer had um, a way to solve a problem that they saw in their work. So in Equate, what we've done is we've done something similar. We've, we've created our four-hour rule where we dedicate a minimum of four hours every week to having conversations with people about the work that they're doing. So what this means for today's context is if the issues you're working on, we're available through our four-hour rule to have one-on-one -on -one or conversations with your team or however it may work about your issues and about how framing could be applied to them thing to do is just to send me an email. My email is there on the screen and we can arrange this conversation. And it's our way of engaging around the issues and helping to uh, share them and explore them beyond what we're able to do just in a webinar format. So thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we look forward to future conversations with you about framing and how it can be applied to controversial issues, the issues you're working on, and to seeing you in our continuing series of webinars for those working to solve health and social problems. Again, my name is Steve Peterson with Equiate. Thank you for your participation today and signing off for today.